Good night, guys. It is a another pleasant rainy night. Hallelujah here in the collapse of global industrial civilization where I guess the drought is over here and at least the Finger Lakes of New York. It, where it is right now. It is Tuesday night, September 6th, and we are at 63 degrees. 63 degrees outside of Ithaca, New York. What was I just hearing? Uh, what is it? Like 115 out there in California? Good Lord. Anyway, guys, you know where to come next week to get away from the heat, but uh, it has been a long day in the tiny house trying to get it ready for next week's shindig. So uh, it's going to be a short, sweet chronicle of the collapse today from the LA Times. Good old LA Times, and they're bringing uh, on board one of my favorite doomers, Vaclav Smeal. I love that name, Vaclav Smeal. Uh, never could get Vaclav to uh, agree to come on the show, as they mentioned it here. He's a hard guy to pin down. We checked in with Vaclav. When was it? Several months ago when he uh, came out with his new book, which they uh, mentioned it here. But they actually, the LA Times actually pinned... Vaclav down for a short email interview. So we're just going to do a little bit of Q&A, but for those of you not who are not aware of who Vaclav Smil, that's S-M-I-L, not sure where, he's European, not sure what country Vaclav, whether he's Russian or what he is. Anyway, for those of you not familiar with Vaclav, Vaclav Smeal rarely agrees to interviews. Too many in the media have portrayed him as a tool of big oil, which is an absolute joke, of course, because he insists on pointing out the, you know, the obvious uh, to I I anybody with half a brain, because he insists on pointing out how deeply dependent humanity is on fossil fuels and how difficult, meaning impossible, it will be to give them up. <clears throat> the economist and professor emeritus at Canada's University of Manitoba heats his house with solar energy. He is no global warming denier. He recognizes the need to move away from plastics, but asks readers to note how often they touch plastic every day and then ask themselves how rapid they think the switch can be. Touching plastic, you know, this computer pretty much plastic. I would say... Good Lord, uh, how many times do I touch plastic every day? I love that I was at Lowe's yesterday. What I was buying were these little metal C clamps. You know, see, you know, to attach my uh, my camper shell to my gas sucking pickup truck. Every single individual, you know, it's a metal clamp. Every single metal clamp at Lowe's uh, individually packaged in a plastic bag. Uh, I was getting a laugh out of that with the cashier. All right, anyway, <clears throat> touching plastic every day. His mission, lay out the facts. I am not an optimist or a pessimist, he likes to say. I am a scientist. Smeal, 79, age 79, has spent a lifetime studying the history of energy. Yes, a little long. Studying the history of energy 
from wood to coal to oil to gas and nuclear to wind and solar and has written dozens of deeply researched books. I have read from several of his... Vaclav has been the subject of several doomsday sermons over the years. He is highly regarded and frequently cited in academic circles and counts Bill Gates among his most famous fans. All right, I finally do. I have something in common with Bill Gates. I never realized I had anything in common with Bill Gates, but I just learned that uh, Uncle Billy and I are both fans of Vaclav Smeal. <laughs> Smeal recently switched to a new publisher and his two latest books, Numbers Don't Lie and How the World Really Works, which I reviewed a few months ago, uh, How the World Really Works, were written and edited to be more accessible to a wider readership. Uh, Vaclav can get a little bit you know, pedantic in his prose, so uh, I guess his last couple of books a little bit more accessible to us regular folk doomers. So the LA Times interviewed Spiel via email following our lightly edited excerpts. Okay, so we're just going to do the Q&A. So the LA Times who is the reporter here? Russ Mitchell. Russ Mitchell. I don't think I have anyone in the family named Russ. So Russ Mitchell managed to get the interview that Sam Mitchell did not get, although I guess he just agreed to an email interview. So we're going to go back and forth. So Russ asked, much of the climate debate you write is dominated by catastrophist. Sandy Shell has called me a catastrophist today. Uh, much of the climate debate you write is dominated by catastrophist who are certain that humanity finds itself on the eve of destruction and the utopians who fervently believe that technology will save the human race. How should the rest of us, yes, yeah, so, you know, the, the, uh, the, the fat of the bell curve, you know, the 90% of people who never think about any of this, uh, never occurs to them, you know, those people. How should the rest of us clueless morons think about real solutions to serious energy and environmental problems. Take it away, Vaclav. Nothing can be more counterproductive than any certainty regarding complex affairs. I don't look at the collapse of uh, global industrial civilization and the planet as all that complex. It seems pretty simple to me. There's too damn many people on this planet eating too much stuff. This is not complex. It's not complicated. There's too damn many people eating too much stuff on the planet. Okay? And once you figure that out, then you become a catastrophist who realizes that humanity is on the eve of destruction. So I don't know what the guy is talking about. But anyway... This is uh, Vaclav's, I'm not here to debate Vaclav, I'm here to read uh, what he has to say about this. <clears throat> Nothing can be more counterproductive than any certainty regarding complex affairs. Uncertainty and unpredictability will always remain the most fundamental attributes of human existence. In managing our energy affairs, we should constantly favor doable steps, not wasting 40% of our food 
grown with high energy expense, not to heat or cool the universe in poorly designed oversized houses, not to waste fuel and materials driving SUVs nearly two tons of mass to move usually a single body, not to design cities that demand lengthy commutes, not to keep amassing rarely used products, and not to travel mindlessly. Instead, we continue and expand our wasteful ways while trying to come up with miraculous and in the near term most unlikely solutions. Everything from running on hydrogen to controlled fusion. Good luck with that. So that was, he didn't really answer the question uh, how should the rest of us think about real solutions to serious energy and environment? I didn't really hear. He did a pretty good job of dodging that question, but he sounds to me like he's on the catastrophist side of the uh, debate. Okay, back to Russ Mitchell. Russ. <clears throat> Many people and policymakers seem to think with enough money and willpower, we can rapidly switch to renewable energy. You believe this is a delusion and the transformation will take decades. So this is what Vaclav has to say about that. It is not a matter of belief. What is decisive is the size of the global energy system, its economic and infrastructural inertia. Fossil fuels now supply about 83% of the world's commercial energy, compared to 86% in the year 2000. The new renewables wind and solar now provide, after two decades of development, still less than 6% of the world's primary energy, still less than hydroelectricity. What are the chances? What are the chances that after going from 86% to 83%, during the first two decades of the 20, 21st century, the world will go from 83% to zero during the next two decades, especially as a few weeks ago China announced additional 300 million tons of new coal production for 2022, and India an additional 400 million tons of coal by the end of 2023. We are still running into fossil fuels, not away from them. Back to Russ. <clears throat> You drive a Honda Civic with a small, efficient engine. While not opposed to electric vehicles, you take issue with those who buy them thinking they are doing their part to solve global warming. Mission accomplished. Okay, this is the uh, <laughs> Vaclav's response about the bright green lie of electric vehicles saving the planet. <clears throat> Vaklov. There are no electric vehicles. There are no EVs. They are battery vehicles reflecting the electricity's origins. If I were to buy an EV in Manitoba, you know, that's where he lives, it would be a 100% percent 
hydroelectricity, truly zero carbon energy car. In North China, it is a 90% coal car. In France, it is a 70% nuclear car. In Russia, mostly a natural gas car. And in Denmark, a 50% wind car, etc. But that is only as far as the direct energies go. Indirect energies going into the production of steel, plastics, glass, and of course batteries are still mostly fossil fuels because the world's primary energy use is now still 83% dependent on fossil carbon. The notion that any electric vehicle is a zero carbon car is nonsense. <sighs> Thank you, Vaclav Smil, for pointing out the myth of the EV. <clears throat> okay. Now, as I said, the last time uh, that I, I talked about Vaclav was when he came out with his newest book, How the World Works. And, I, and I'm embarrassed to admit I have, not, I have not read it. I've just read excerpts of it. <clears throat> How the World Works goes into what you call the four pillars of modern civilization, ammonia, plastics, steel, and concrete. It seems that most people think of only electricity generation and transportation in relation to fossil fuels and climate change. Vaclav's response to that, You are quite right. Most people think of decarbonization as just an electricity problem. They do not realize the amount of energy used directly as fuels and electricity and indirectly as feedstocks to make materials that define modern civilization. And this is what I, Robert Jensen was mentioning in this interview with me a few nights ago pointing this out. Without modern nitrogen fertilizers we could feed only about one half of today's humanity. They, meaning nitrogen fertilizer, start with ammonia, and ammonia synthesis is based mostly on natural gas. No material, you know, actual physical material, is made in larger quantities than cement, the key ingredient of concrete, the ubiquitous construction material. Steel comes from second and iron smelting. Steel comes second um, after uh, cement. Steel comes second and iron smelting needs coke made from coal and obviously synthesis of plastics needs natural gas and oil as feedstocks and fuel. Making just these four materials. One more time, what are the four, the big four? <clears throat> Ammonia, plastics, steel, and concrete. Making just these four materials requires nearly 20% of the world's total energy supply generating about 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Alternative non-carbon ways of making these materials are known, but none is available for immediate large-scale commercial deployment. Decarbonizing this massive demand cannot be done in a matter of years. 
Okay, back to Russ. Some might agree with your conclusions and then become hopeless about humanity's ability to address climate change in any meaningful way. What would you say to Sam Mitchell? I would tell Sam Mitchell that old Romans knew it well. Where difficult matters are at stake, the change is best affected by slow but relentless progress. Evolutions are always preferable to revolutions. The drop of water hollows out the stone by frequent falling. Yeah, I think the Grand Canyon took about 60 million years to, uh, to form, yes. <clears throat> we should persevere in doing many small things and eventually they add up. Yes, over the next 60 million years, uh, the water will hollow out the stone, but so far we are not even seriously trying. See the ascent of SUVs, the pervasiveness of excessive flying, and food supermarkets that now average, well, now, uh, come back in a year, that now average 40,000 items, that all requires plenty of carbon. There you go. Uh, old Vaclav Smeal sounding, uh, I, I, my guess is that Vaclav is one of these catastrophist, uh, you, you know, that, uh, that just doesn't, he doesn't want to scare his grandchildren, I guess. A Vaclav Smeal. Uh, you, you can't know what Vaclav Smeal knows. He has spent, you know, his entire adult life uh, studying this subject. Uh, <laughs> he, he knows damn well the situation is, is hopeless. Uh, anyway. Obviously, you will not find the word overpopulation anywhere in that article. But I'm going to wrap this up because uh, I'm hoping that tomorrow I'm getting up early to finally install this big culvert so we can get a back driveway up the hill. Time to start bringing more uh, cars onto bugs in a jar. The shindig begins one week from tomorrow. Come see us. Bye, guys. Yes, we're going to too bad. <laughs>